Here's what happened, Jerome. I was at an event in Santa Fe called Zozobra. Jerome, what do you want to do with your life? <laughs> yeah, what do you want to be? 100 million people have seen it. I read his book three, four times, and I said, that's what I'm missing. I have a great what, but I don't know my why. I don't know why I'm doing this. And that's when I became obsessed with finding my why. If it's a pattern that repeats over and over and over in your life, why do you have to go back to the time when you're five years old when you can hardly remember it? How about just going back to last week mm -hmm. and figure out two times when you felt successful and you'll see that same pattern. And so that's what I did. There's a difference this. between a dream chaser and a dream catcher. Hey everybody and welcome to the Dream Catchers podcast. I'm your host, Jerome. And I've got Dr. Gary Sanchez in with me today. I feel like he's in New Mexico, but he could be in Phoenix. He could be somewhere overseas. I don't know. Where are you, man? Uh, currently, I am in New Mexico. I'm yes. heading to Austin this weekend, but I am here right now. It's, let's see, probably 70 degrees. A little overcast today, but still golf weather if you're into golf. Yeah, I don't think you play that much, do you? Not as much as I uh, probably should, but no, I haven't had much time to play lately. So I love to open up these interviews and asking this one simple question. So you had an exit. I did have an exit. It was, you know what? Let's start with that because I can tell. Here's what happened, Jerome. I was at an event in Santa Fe called Zozobra. Zozobra, if you look it up, it's kind of like a Burning Man type thing, but not way out in the middle of nowhere and drugs, a whole lot of drugs. There probably was plenty of drugs, but um, it's basically burning all your past and starting afresh. And there's like 25, 30,000 people there. It's a one night event, but I was there for a buddy's birthday party as well. And so, of course, we ate and drank a little bit too much. And I woke up the next morning with a headache. Uh, I, mean, I don't even know how that happens, but I did. I woke up with a headache. And so I was at a hotel in Santa Fe, which is about 45 minutes from Albuquerque, where I'm from. Went down to the front desk, uh, asked them if they had any Advil. Guy gave me a couple Advil, took those, went to bed, didn't think about it again. What happened was one of the Advil didn't dissolve and it lodged in my GI tract and it burnt a hole right where there was an artery. And so I started to bleed internally and I didn't know it. And so I drive all the way home, even went to the gym, just wasn't feeling good. Just kind of, uh, you know, kind of, kind of a crappy feeling and, uh, went to, got back from the gym and went into the bathroom and just started throwing up blood and blood was coming out both ends and everywhere you want to imagine. And it wasn't, um, wasn't that pleasant, kind of scary. So I called my buddy who's a gastroenterologist. He said, you got to get to the ER. So I go over to the ER and it was a really busy weekend. So I ended up having to wait 11 hours in the um, emergency room. By the time they finally admitted me, my blood pressure was 60 over 30 and I'd lost half my blood. And so I wasn't in a private room either. So I get up to go to the restroom because uh, blood in your GI tract acts like a laxative. So I had to go to the bathroom all the time. And uh, I go to the restroom, lock the door behind me. And then I pass out and I hit my head on the sink and I end up knocked out on the ground. And luckily I woke up and there's blood everywhere. And I push the door open and then I pass out again. And uh, luckily somebody found me. And next thing I know, I wake up in a bed. The room's full of people running around like crazy. My clothes are all cut off. I have the two pads on me. They um, revive me. And then off to surgery to try to get to that bleed. They couldn't get to it. So they just waited. And while we were waiting, they decided to do a CAT scan. And so if you have you ever had a uh, CAT scan before? Mm -hmm. uh, well, they pump all the dye into you, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have for sure. So they pump all the dye into you. Well, when they did that, they blew out the my arm. They blew out the blood vessels in my arm. What? So, yeah. So then they have to do an ultrasound to see where the blood clots are. So guy comes in in the middle of the night, does a, an a ultrasound, and they find out that the blood clots are growing into my lungs. And so the next day, the doctor walks in and says, hey, you know, we've got to stop those blood clots because if they get to your lungs, you're going to die. But if we try to stop the blood clots, we can't get to the bleed. So you're going to die. 
I said, that's wonderful. Uh, like, what are we going to do? He said, I don't know what we're going to do. And luckily, and right then my cell phone rings and it's a buddy of mine who's a cardiologist at that hospital. He said, Hey, Gary, I saw that you're in here and I saw what they're going to do. And, um, I don't like what they're going to do. And so I'm going to take over. And so I was in the ICU for nine days. A lot of crazy stuff happens in there. Uh, but, uh, uh, at the end, obviously I made it cause I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I died. No, uh, at the end, what happened was I had to go to bed one evening with a IV of heparin, which is a blood thinner and hope that I didn't bleed. And luckily I didn't. And so once I made it through that, then they were able to give me blood thinners, stop all the, the, the blood clots. And here I am today. But the reason I'm telling you that is because I went back to my dental practice. So I was a dentist at that time. And one of my patients who was in his mid eighties took me aside and he said, Hey, Gary, you know, you got a second chance on life. He said, I want you to think about something. When you get to be my age and you look back on your life, are you going to be glad that you stayed a dentist? Or are you going to wish that you'd taken this why thing to the world? Cause he knew all about it. And I said, I'm going to wish that I'd taken this why thing to the world. And he said, well, then you know what you need to do. And that's when I sold my dental practice and I went all in on what we can talk about now, which is the Y Institute. So that's what made me, that forced me into an exit. Didn't force me. I mean, I could have still done it, but it made me think in a way that, you know, what am I doing with my life? Where do I really want to spend it? And so for the listeners, you know, hopefully you're not ever forced into a situation like that before you actually think about it, because I could have seen myself continuing with one foot in each, in each thing uh, until I didn't do very good at either, which is kind of what was happening. So that's a, that's a pre-story into maybe what we're going to be talking about, but you didn't know that. I know. No, you've been holding out. (laughs) You've been holding out. That is phenomenal. The resilience that it takes to make it through that. And, oh, we got these two dilemmas. We can give you blood thinners so you don't die from blood clots in your lungs, but you could bleed out. Uh, Yeah, yeah, we don't know which one to do. Which one would you like us to do with all of your medical knowledge and experience? (laughs) So you're you're You're... hitting on something right there, uh, Jerome. The You know, I had never been the patient in the hospital. I'd been to see a lot of patients. And I'd never been in the bed part like you have and, and, and I have now. So I didn't understand what it was really like. But to me, and maybe you can re- relate to this, the worst part about being in the hospital was no sleep. Yeah. I mean, Somebody's I always can pop in. Yeah. Someone's always popping in. I-, I can go a night with no sleep. And I feel, pre- you know, for the listeners, if you've never been in the hospital, how do you feel after you don't get any sleep for one night? How about two nights or three nights? You know, I know you were in there quite a while, but you know, eight days in, you haven't slept, but a few hours and they're asking you to make life changing decisions. You're like, I can't even put two words together, much Mm -hmm. less make a decision about what I want to do with my life and what I want you to do on me. So that was an interesting experience. Uh, did, did you experience that same sort of thing? It's awful. But I think I got a little more time because I had 14 hours of surgery twice. And Oof. so I slept during that and I slept, I guess, coming out of that, right? Trying to recover and the grogginess. So there were days that I, I mean, there were days I just don't remember, right? As a result of it. But yeah, I mean- on the backside of that, after the surgery is over, yeah, there's somebody, and then the beeping and the booping and the the squishing and the, <laughs> it's just like, oh, is this supposed to sound like that? But yeah, I mean, it's an absolutely awful experience, and I I wish it on nobody, but um, they're absolutely saving lives. So, all right, you're basically out of your practice for multiple weeks because you were in the hospital. Um, yep. How did it keep, how did it survive? Because I mean, for a lot of folks, they are the business. Had you gotten to a place where you weren't the business anymore and so it could work without you? 
Not really. So um, I, I luckily I practiced with my brother. And so he keep kept everything going. Uh, he had had a medical issue a few years before that. So I, I was, he broke his, you know, his arm and his shoulder uh, his, and he's right-handed. So he broke the right side. So I was his help during all that time. And luckily he was there for me during, during this time, but you're right. Dentistry is, you know, if I'm not there, I'm not producing. In fact, I'm losing a ton by not showing up. So I had a couple of weeks of that, um, which is very expensive on top of all the other things that we were going through. But, you know, that was my motivation for the exit, for the getting out of something I never really know or knew if I should have been doing in the first place. So maybe we should go back to there it is. Yeah, there it is. So, so many of us do things because they pay well. And then we devote our lives to it because we build a lifestyle around the thing that pays well. And then you actually had the intervention with your older client which said, are you sure that this is your deal? So let's go back to the beginning. How did you get into dentistry? So back in, you know, you know, when you think about when you're in high school and your, your parents, friends come over and you're like, what's the first question they ask you, right? Well, well Jerome, what do you want to do with your life? <laughs> yeah. What do you want to be? And you're like, shit, I don't know. Uh, uh, I have no idea what I want to be. Well, where do you want to go to college? I don't know where I want to, how am I supposed to figure out where I want to go to college? I don't even know what I want to be. So I went off to University of Colorado in Boulder because some of my friends were there and it seemed like a fun place to go. And, and it was. And so I had a great time in college, probably didn't learn much uh, other than how to be on your own. And then you have to decide on a major. So a couple of years in, Jerome, what's your major going to be? Because I was undeclared. So didn't know, just picked what I had a good grade in. Uh, which was biology. At that time in my life, sports was kind of a big deal for me. I was really involved in uh, was playing professional racquetball, traveling around the country, playing in tournaments here, all over the place. And, and it looked like that was going to be a direction I was going to go uh, until I got injured and then realized that's not the place I want to put my you know future. So I had to figure something else out. I had to find a better way, which was uh, I ended up picking dentistry. So, you know, once you pick a major, then you got to pick a, what you're going to do with that, which ended up being going off to dental school. So I went to USC dental school, um, mainly just to try it because I knew the lifestyle. My dad was a dentist. Mm. So I thought, let me go check it out and see if I like it. And turns out I, you know, had a great time, uh, at USC, great time in dental school, get out of dental school, go into practice with my dad. He retires then I become, uh, um, my brother joins me. But what happens to most of us, at least, is we start to accumulate things, mm -hmm. right? You get cars, houses, spouses, kids, all those things, and not really realizing, and you become very invested into your career, wanting to be the best. Mm -hmm. And then you stop all of a sudden one day and think, was this really what I should have done? Mm -hmm. You know, I know I did it, but now you're in it. You got lots of overhead and you can't quit. Mm -hmm. You got to hang in there, right? At least I, I had to. Mm -hmm. So you hang in there for quite a while until you finally realize maybe this isn't what I really wanted to do. And now your runway is going to be a lot shorter when you finally figure out what you want to do. And so I was kind of forced into that. But along the way, I um, when I got out of dental school, Jerome, the advice that I was given by the experts was build a great product and people will come, right? Build a great product and people will come. So I spent 20 years doing that, reaching the highest to get to in dentistry, working with the best mentors, best institutes, beautiful practice, all the technology, really well-trained team. And I still blended in with everybody else who said, yeah, I'm a dentist too. And it drove me crazy. Well, well, they, most dentists take 20 hours of CE a year. I was taking 240 hours every year. I mean, we had an amazing product, but nobody knew about us. Mm -hmm. I mean, we just, people got used to it being that way. And then that's just the way it was. And uh, that's, that's when I, yeah. And that's when I heard about this uh, concept of why. 
I saw Simon Sinek's TED Talk. Yeah. I bet you you've seen it. A lot of the listeners have seen it. A hundred million people have seen it. I read his book three, four times. And I said, that's what I'm missing. I have a great what, but I don't know my why. I don't know why I'm doing this. And that's when I became obsessed with finding my why. So I called Simon. I said, Simon, I need you to help me discover my why. He and I spent about eight months together going back through my life, looking for clues, finally figured out my why, which is to find a better way and share it, to find a better way and share it. That's why I do everything in my life. I'm always in search of a better way. And then I share it. And that's when my life started to make sense to me. I have a lot of patents and products and inventions that are better ways of doing things. And so I took what I learned from some of my mentors and from Simon Sinek. And in my dental practice, we stopped talking about what we do, crowns, bridges, fillings, complete gum care, all that stuff. And we started talking about why we do what we do and what we believe. Right? We believe that life is better when you have great teeth, that you can't have a good life if you have bad teeth. And that's when my practice really took off. We went from just getting by to having abundance. And as my practice took off, I started getting calls from other dentists that said, can you help me do what you're doing? So I went back and figured out what Simon was trying to do, and I made it better. So instead of taking six or eight or 10 months to help someone discover their why, I could sit down with you, Jerome, and in about an hour, help you figure out what your why was, and then build your messaging, marketing, and branding all based on your why for whatever business you were in. And so I did this for thousands of people for free all over the world, on stages, on Skype. And you remember, I'm a dentist, so I have a captive patient sitting right there in the chair for me. And while they're getting numb, they're going to get their why discovered. So wow. I did this for so many people that I started to notice patterns and trends and similarities. And I figured out that there's only nine different whys. And that's the most important thing I discovered because once I knew there were nine different whys, then we had an endpoint. Then I could teach other people what I was doing. Then I could get more data. And with that data, I was able to develop the why discovery in 2016 that found just your why. And then you took the why OS or the why operating system discovery that finds your why, your how, and your what, and builds your message for you in about eight minutes. And so now the Y Institute, which is what I'm doing now, um, brings that to coaches, consultants, creative agencies uh, con um, around the world so that they can help their clients mm -hmm. find their why and take it from concept to reality, to application, you know, to go from uncertainty to clarity. That's really what it does. And so that was the quick version of, uh, of my story. And that's when you know, the 85-year-old patient told me, when you get to be my age, are you going to wish you'd taken this why thing to the world? Or are you going to be glad that you stayed a dentist? And, you know, at that point in time, Jerome, my practice was on autopilot. I was only working three days a week. I had four-day weekends every weekend. I was making lots of money. A lot of great things going on. So walking away from that the known to the unknown of developing software and bringing that to the world was pretty scary, right? Terrifying would be my guess because you never know if the software is going to work. You don't know if it's going to uptake. Sure, you had proof of concept because you had people in chairs, but would they come for this if they weren't there for some other reason, right? You were, you were getting people because they were there for something else. You had a captive audience. So yes. you said this so casually and I just can't let it go. You said, I called Simon up. Yeah. <laughs> the guy that's got a TED talk with a hundred million views. I called Simon up. How do you call Simon up? I like <laughs> to call Simon up. I, I watched that talk in 20, whatever, 2015, 2012, whenever it was 2010, I can't remember. But how do you call Simon up? Because you, your your practice wasn't on autopilot. There wasn't abundance at this point. So how do you call Simon up? Yeah, you know, um, I, at that time, had hired a guy to coach me, and his name was John Asaraf. Do you know John Asaraf? He, I do. <laughs> no. Yeah, John Asaraf was, um, he was in the movie The Secret. Um, and so that's how I got 
how I heard about Simon Sinek. I he interviewed Simon in one of his weekly interviews. And so then I reached out to John Asaraf and I said, hey, can you connect me with Simon? Because I want to discover my why. And so that's how I got to Simon. This was back in 2009. So he wasn't really as much on the speaking tour like he is now as he was back then. And so, like I said, he and I spent about eight months together, multiple phone calls going through the, his process. So his process, he didn't really have one, but it was basically go back through your life, looking for clues, uh, looking for a pattern as to why you felt successful. And so we went all the way back to when I was a kid looking for these different clues. And so once I figured out my why, what I did is I went back and figured out what he was trying to do, which, which was looking for a pattern in the stories. So for the listeners, your why is part of the limbic brain, the limbic part of your brain. Now, the limbic part of your brain is the part of the brain that's responsible for feelings like loyalty, mm -hmm. trust are all part of the limbic brain, but it doesn't have the capacity for language. So you, you can't tell somebody why you feel a certain way. You just feel that way, right? Why do you mm -hmm. love your spouse or significant other? Well, I don't know why I love them. I just do. Or you maybe try to name the things they do or don't do, but a feeling is hard to explain. So the only way that I could get to the why was through stories. So I would ask you to tell me stories about in, uh, times in your life when you felt successful. And that's what Simon and I did. So, but we went all the way back to when I was a little kid. Here's what I realized. If it's a pattern, Pattern that repeats over and over and over in your life. Why do you have to go back to the time when you're five years old, when you can hardly remember it? How about just going back to last week mm -hmm. and figure out two times when you felt successful and you'll see that same pattern. And so that's what I did. And I saw this pattern over and over and over. And that's where the nine whys came from. Mm -hmm. And then um, I went back and showed Simon what I was doing. And it took his process or what he, what he was doing and it streamlined it to where it was something that was much quicker. Now, then all I had was the nine whys. I didn't have the software yet. The software didn't come for another six years. So I just showed people how to do what I was doing. And here's the interesting thing, Jerome. For the longest time, I just thought I was special. I put in the 10,000 hours. I'm the one who sees the pattern. You have to come to me to discover your why, because I'm the only one who's figured this out, which was not true, but that's what I thought mm -hmm. because I had done it so many times. And then I got challenged. And a friend of mine said, well, you know, if that's true, then how big of an impact is this really going to have? Oh no. Pop the if you're bubble. the only one who can do yeah. this and you can only work with a few people a day, how big of an impact is this going to have? So there's got to be a way for you to figure out how to scale this. So he challenged me to do that. And I figured out how to do it. So here's something to think about for your listeners. If, if you're somebody who has a process that you feel is your own proprietary process and and it's what makes you special and it's a big part of of what you do and who you are think about this for a minute let's say you were a painter and you get emotionally physically mentally involved with creating this masterpiece painting and it takes you months and months to just get this masterpiece painting up on the canvas once it's on the canvas, there's other ways to get to that painting without having to go through what you went through. You can do paint by numbers. You could take a picture of it and break it down and create an outline and break all the colors down. There's so many other ways you could get to that painting once it's there. Mm -hmm. So that's what happened for me, Jerome. I figured out there were nine different whys. Because of all these stories, I've heard story after story after story after story after story. Once I knew there were nine whys, 
I figured out a different way to get to those nine whys where I didn't have to listen to any of the stories so that it couldn't, so I would have to interpret what I thought I heard. Now, I've done more why discoveries than anybody in the world. And I was only about 70% accurate. 30% of the time I was wrong. Mm. The software took out the human element, the interpretation part, and it's 100% accurate. And that's what we were looking for. So it got even better by removing the human part of it. So instead of listening to the story to figure out the why, what we do now is we hear the, we find the why through the software and then listen to the story that's proof of the why. Does that make sense? Makes a lot of sense. I was just thinking as you were going through that, that we may be doing the audience a disservice if they haven't if they weren't one of the hundred million people that listen to the Simon uh, Sinek start with why talk. And so can, why is why important and why is why superior to how and what? Great question. When you know your why you go from uncertainty to clarity. What do I mean by that? If you're uncertain about who you are, and when you know who you are is when you can say it, not when you think it's sort of kind of maybe I think I might be this. It's when you have the words to clearly articulate why you do what you do, how you bring your why to life and what it is people can count on from you. When you can say that, that's when you're certain. That's when you know. So you go from uncertainty to clarity. Now, Simon Sinek developed this golden circle concept. So if you can imagine three concentric circles, like a bullseye. On the outer part of it is, is your what. The middle section would be your how. And the, and the set, uh, I'm sorry, the, the outer ring would be your why. The middle ring would be your how. And the center one would be your why. So if you were have a piece of paper and you draw three circles around each other, the inside would be why, then how, then what. What Simon talks about is he said, everybody knows what they do. I'm a dentist, I'm in real estate, I, I'm a lawyer, whatever it is that you do, everybody knows what they do. Some know how they do what they do. And by how we mean, what are the proprietary processes that you think make you different? He said, but very few know why they do what they do. By mm -hmm. why, we mean what's your purpose, what's your cause, what's your belief. And it's the inspiring people like Martin Luther King and Steve Jobs, inspiring companies like Apple, Southwest Airlines, Harley Davidson, that start with why, then tell you how they do what they do. And lastly, what it is they do that connects with you in a completely different way that allows you to make a decision because it feels right. And when I heard that, I was like, man, that is what I'm missing. I have a great what, but I don't know my why. So for the listeners, let me give you an example. <clears throat> when Apple launched their iPad 3, most successful launch in history. They made $2.5 billion in a weekend. They started their launch video, not by telling you what it is or what they have or how it works. They started their launch video by saying, we believe that technology is at its best when it's invisible, when you are only conscious of what you're doing and not the device that you're doing it on. And then they went to tell you how they created that. And lastly, what it is, their tablet PC or iPad. So when you start with why, it allows the other person to say, yeah, that's what I believe too. So if you believe that technology is at its best when it's invisible, you're going to love the iPad 3. If you don't believe that, you're not going to love it. And that's okay too. So when you talk about your why and you use the words, I believe, right? I believe that success happens when we find a better way and are able to share it. How I do that is by making things clear and understandable. And ultimately what I bring are simple solutions. So for me, it's got to be better, clear, and simple. So if you're listening and you believe that success comes when we find better ways, then you and I are going to get along great. You're going to love everything that I do. 
If you're about a better way, that's how I think. So we're going to have a great relationship. You're going to love the products that I develop. You're going to love our conversations. And, and same thing, vice versa. If you don't believe that, then we probably won't get along. And that's okay too. Can't get along with everybody. Does that make sense? Makes a lot of sense. And it boils down a lot of the confusion. Like I think folks use a lot of words that aren't necessary in order to try to communicate a point, but it's because they don't have clarity. And so if you're not clear about what you're supposed to be doing and how you do that thing, and more importantly, why you're doing any of it, then there's going to be a feeling or a sense of loss. People are going to question whether or not they should trust you because you don't seem to know, you don't have the certainty. Um, when people exit, when I think the biggest things that they struggle with is the lack of certainty on the other side of the exit. You alluded to it when you were talking about leaving a flourishing practice behind to build a technology company along with all of the IP that went with it. But I think we just kind of mentioned it. We didn't actually dig into what the centers of doubt are or why they're created on the backside of an exit. And most people just think, well, because I have more money and more time than I've ever had, that everything's going to be okay. But that's not true for most people. In fact, I haven't met anybody who didn't go through the founder's exit paradox unless they didn't, unless they took a job. Basically, they got, their company got bought and they worked for that new job for the couple of years on the backside of their exit. But even a lot of those folks struggle because they went from being the owner to an employee and being told what to do and finding out that many of the promises they were made prior to the exit didn't actually happen. So for the founder who can't imagine being an employee and they know that they have to figure out what that second mountain is, they have to figure out their next it's my belief that knowing why is going to speed up the process probably more than anything else they can do. Uh, you're nodding yep. your head in agreement and you built something called the why Institute. So I think you're sold on this why concept, but is there, is there a piece of this that I'm missing? Is there some other additional context that you like to add? For sure. You you're, you're nailing it. And, and here's why. What people are really looking for is purpose and passion and direction. When you know your why, how, and what, well, if what you choose to do with your life is in line with your why, your how, and your what, you will have passion for what you do. So let me say that again. When what you do is in line with your YOS, your Y operating system, you will love what you do and you will have passion for what you do. And passion is the fuel that gives you the energy to pursue your dreams. Without passion, you give up. With passion, you persevere. So Jerome, when I exited my dental practice, I didn't take a paycheck for three years. Three years, I put every cent back in. Hey guys, as you might know, a very small percentage of the people who actually listen to this podcast are subscribers. So do us a favor, subscribe. In fact, we did some analytics and we found out that only 25% of the people who listen are subscribers. And our goal is to get that to about 75% over the next three months. So do us a favor hit the subscribe button so you get notified when our new episode we plan to bring immense value to you guys going forward as we continue to improve the content that we create at dream Cup. the dream should be real so i wasn't even getting paid and i'm working my rear end off and for the beginning of it i was by myself i didn't have a team like i do now i didn't have a tech team i didn't have an assistant i didn't have a marketing department i had none of, it was me Chief just me officer yeah I'm the everything officer, not getting paid, 
working way harder than I was as a dentist, mm -hmm. not knowing if I made the right choice, believing that I made the right choice, but I had so much passion and so much energy. I feel bad for my family because they had to listen to me talk about why 24 seven every day, but man, did I love it. I loved every second of it. I wouldn't change it. I didn't care about the money. All I cared about was, man, I am on the right path. I, I was in my lane, loving every second of it. So let's go to back for, for your listeners. Let, let's talk for a second about your YOS. So for Jerome, Jerome's why. Is it okay if I tell him your YOS? Yeah, man, this is so good because to, to put things in perspective, if we go down this path. So I, Gary, I'm standing in the hallway. Gary walks up. I confuse him for the guy in the booth next to me. And then he's like, no. And then I was like, I know your name. I don't know where I know your name from. And we keep talking. He starts breaking down YOS. And then he starts to tell me about my business. And I'm like, what is going on here? And then I remember how I heard his name and I got exposed to the concept. And then he's like, all right, do this. And so I'm standing there and I do the thing and he gets it. And then he tells me about myself better than I could tell other people about myself. And I'm sitting there baffled, totally baffled with how I put some answers into a survey thing. Assessment is probably the technical term for it. And then I, he gives me all the words that I should use to introduce myself to other people. Please go ahead. <laughs> well, so um, for the listeners, I developed, you know, I took the, all that I'd learned about the nine whys and all the data that I had gotten and created an, the algorithm for how to do it um, using software. And then I actually learned the software and programmed it myself because I was so pissed off at this tech company that was taking me for a ride. I said, if that idiot can figure it out, then I can figure it out. And in one weekend, Jerome, one weekend, I developed the algorithm learned how to program the software and program the software in one weekend. So my, my next book is going to be called the power of pissed off because I was so <laughs> pissed off that I was like, I'm going to figure this out. If, if I don't get any sleep, I don't care. I am going to figure it out. And I did. And that's what we still use that same algorithm, same stuff. But what it does is it like we talked about it finds your why how and what that was just the one that finds your your why but the new software finds your why how and what so for jerome jerome's why he believes that success happens when he contributes to something greater than himself to a greater cause when he adds value to other people how he does that is by making sense out of the complex and challenging solving problems phenomenal problem solver Ultimately, what Jerome brings is a trusting relationship where others can count on him. But he's not going to tell you something that's not true. He wants to be that trusted source in your life. In fact, Jerome, you probably couldn't tell somebody something if it wasn't true, right? Yeah, we're not going to do that. <laughs> it's too not important. Yeah. yeah. So his why is contribute, contribute to greater cause, contribute. His how is make sense. Uh, and is what is trust. How does that feel to you? What I just said about you? Oh, it's absolutely accurate. And why we're doing what we're doing, right? I think one of the most complicated problems is what do you do after you have availability of the resources that you may have never imagined that you could have, right? You've got more time, money, and energy than you've ever had. And you've walked into a place of uncertainty. And so how do you figure out what's next? And then who do you invite into your foxhole while you're figuring that out? It's got to be somebody that you trust, right? And my goal is to help people make that bigger contribution. You got challenged to figure out how you could scale your thing. And now my thing is, how do I help you figure out you being a NEO, newly exited operator? How do I help you figure out what that thing is that you're going to contribute to society? Because if I don't help you figure it out, then we may have wasted your trip to this planet. Right, Because there are people who are counting on you, who you haven't met, to do the thing that you've been placed here to do. And even if you don't know how to do it, 
we still need to get it done. And it's my belief that I can help people figure out how to get that thing done. You have the perfect YOS for what you do. So here's what we were. So let, let's use Jerome as an example. So if you're listening to this, where you can write things down at all, you know, write down the word contribute, the word make sense and the word, the two words make sense and the word trust. So contribute makes sense, trust. So for Jerome, if we put you in a place, Jerome wants to have an impact. He wants to help other people. He wants to solve problems. He wants to be the trusted source. So if we put you in a place, Jerome, let's say you have your exit, trying to figure out what to do. And we put you in a place where you don't get to have an impact we put you in a cubicle where you're just crunching numbers, doing the same thing every day, um, not getting a lot of recognition, not not really getting noticed, but you have a job. How's that going to work for you? Not. <laughs> not, not. Right? Yeah. not at all. But if we put you in a place where you're going to get to contribute to other people's success, find ways to help them help them solve their problems, no matter how complex they are, and be the trusted source that grabs their hand and just walks them to the, uh, you know, the finish line. How's that going to feel for you? Oh, that's heaven. Heaven. It's on heaven. Yeah. Do it every day. Do it for free if you could. Right. And, and you can. I mean, you it's just what you want to be doing. Mm -hmm. So for those of you that are listening, when you know your YOS, your why, how and what, if what you choose to do with your life is in line with that, where you get to live it, you will love it. It'll be your passion. You will do it all day, every day, never run out of energy. And that's how this Y Institute has been for me since I left my practice. Unlimited. If you'd ask my wife, she'll say, I can't believe how much energy you have. Well, it's because I love what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I just can't get enough of it. And that's when it's really fun. So when you get to the point where you have enough and now you get to do what you want, make sure that it's something that you love. And that's how you can figure that out in advance. Discover your YOS, figure out what you're thinking about doing Will it allow you to live? Will, will that what you choose to do allow you to live your YOS within it? Will it be in alignment with it? And if it is, freaking go for it. If it isn't, you could do it, but you're going to run out of energy. And I don't know how much fun that is. And if you don't have to, don't do it, right? Well, and that's the whole point of being on the backside of the exit. You got the resources, so you shouldn't be doing things that don't invigorate and empower you and excite you. And I, the money is never going to be the reason, you know, what's funny is none of your wise is money. <laughs> Byproduct. Byproduct. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk it, a little it, bit about that because, you know, some people talk about, Oh, you know, my, my hobbies are business and, you know, I just want to pay the game of business and, uh, make more money. And I don't think that's anybody's real why. I think it's a really shallow answer that allows people to not do the self-reflection. And so you, you gave us my three and your three. I'm trying to figure out if they overlap, but I think we've talked about six of the nine. Um, we did. Are you, your the other three are, are they money and ego and fame or what are the other three? Yeah. It's funny you say that because when I, when I speak at events around the world, I'll say something like, uh, you know, when you know your why, what you do has more impact and for, people will naturally come up to me and say, yeah, you know, I, I agree with you. Uh, in fact, I know my why and I'll be great. Well, what's your why? And okay. they'll pull out their phone and they'll show me pictures of their kids yeah. And say, well, this is my why. This, this is why I do what I do. Or they'll show me the new business or the new book or maybe a, a picture of a red dress or something. I got to get into that dress in six months. So that's why I'm working out the way I'm working out. Now, what they're talking about is, is still really important. Um, mm -hmm. That's a short-term motivation for doing things the way they're doing it. 
-hmm. When the kids grow up or the business moves on or the wedding passes, they lose their why. What we're talking about is more, even more profound. You know, why you do what you do everywhere you go. Why do you operate the way that you operate? And so there are nine whys. I'll go through them real quickly. If you happen to have a pen or pencil and piece of paper, the first why is um, Jerome's why, which is contribute, right? Contribute to a greater cause, add value, have an impact in the lives of others. The second why is trust, to create relationships based upon trust, to be the trusted source, to be the ones uh, that others can count on. Uh, the third why is make sense make sense, to make sense out of things, especially if complex or complicated. These are people that are great problem solvers. The fourth why is better way, better way, which is my why, to find a better way and share it. These are people that are really good at innovating things, taking something that's already there and improving upon it. They're rarely satisfied, always trying to improve things. Uh, the fifth why is right way, right way, to do things the right way in order to get results. These are structure, mm -hmm. process, systems people. They find things that work and they stick to them. The sixth why is challenge, challenge, to challenge the status quo and think differently. These are people that don't like to follow the rules, don't want to draw inside the lines, don't want to show up on time. They want to do things their own way. They're the ones with the purple hair or the, you know, the think way outside the box. Uh, Richard Branson, Herb Kelleher from Southwest Airlines, uh, Steve Jobs have this why. The seventh why is mastery, mastery, to seek mastery and understanding. These are people that like depth, breadth, detail. They take the simple, make it complex by diving in really deep. For mm -hmm. you and I, Jerome, it's three steps to cook a scrambled egg. For them, it's 28 steps because they know everything about every step. The eighth why is clarify, clarify, to make things clear, crystal clear and understandable. They're the ones that ask a lot of questions. First to be clear on what was the question, and then a lot of questions to make sure they get clear on the answer. And they write you the long text or the long email. And then the last why is simplify, to decrease complexity, make easier to understand, easier to do they have a uh, they want things direct to the point don't give me the fluff don't beat around the bush just hit me with it so those are the nine whys real quickly all of us have all of them mm -hmm. one of them is more dominant than the rest and that's the one that becomes your why and the, another one becomes your how and your what so you can try to guess it but it's you you're usually not right so if you go through and discover your YOS, you'll just have it there for you. So, you know, on my website, you can go to the website, uh, the YOS discovery is not expensive. It's 97 bucks. It'll find your why, how, and what, and build your message for you in about eight minutes. And it'll be accurate. And then you can use it, which is kind of the whole point, right, Jerome? The point isn't just to discover it, it's to then go use it. I love it. I can't leave this alone, though. Why isn't it just money, fame, greed, power, like all of the stuff that a lot of people talk about? Why aren't those in there? Is that <laughs> how did you figure out that those weren't actually the wise or the kid or the wife or because my grandpa said I have to like, how did you get from much of what people talk about as their wise to these nine? I worked with a lot of very, very successful people at one point that had no idea why they were here. They got all the stuff. You've seen it. I mean, you see it all the time. They, they've got all the stuff and they're miserable. Mm -hmm. So it's not about the stuff. That's not why they're here. Why are you here on earth? And it's not to just accumulate stuff. There's a reason that you're here there's something inside you that's special. It's already there. You don't have to make it up. It's been there since you were born. You just have to know what it is to be able to utilize it in your life. But, you know, most people play small or they put on a costume. 
because they're just not sure who they are. And, you know, think about Halloween, Jerome, you, you put a costume on and it's fun at first. And it's exciting at first to be somebody else. But by the end of the night, oh my gosh, you can't wait to get that off. And that's how a lot of people live their whole life. Me included, me included. I'm not, I'm not saying not me. I was put in a different box when I started as a dentist that I didn't want to be in, but I had agreed to it. You know, I'd chosen it, but was it what I should have been doing? I still wrestle with that question because, and this is why I don't think it was the right fit for me. But by not being the right fit, it put me on the path of figuring out this why thing. Mm -hmm. What if I had never been on that path to figure this out? So was it the right thing or was it not the right thing? I'm not sure how to answer that. Oh, it's was always your... right. I mean, it's a journey, right? It's a yeah. journey. I, I read a quote that said, if you erase all your mistakes then you don't exist right and so each thing is my belief and i don't know this is true and my my process for helping people figure out their next is very clunky like simon's uh, everything that you go through is preparing you for the next thing that you do and so the stories are important the experiences are important and some of them just to create this visceral reaction right I don't know how long you cleaned the 85 year old guy's teeth. Right. But there had to be some relationship that was built that gave him the comfort to be able to challenge you in the way that he did, which then took you on the path. And so that angel being a part of the journey, if you don't have this experience, maybe he shows up in some other way, but maybe not. And this kind of goes back to, well, and you did a lot of good, right? If people, if you don't believe people can have a good life, if they don't have good teeth, then like all of those people that you helped have better teeth had a better life as a result. of. So, I mean, but is that, do you want that on your tombstone? Probably not. Right. Instead of what some of the things you could say associated with family or YOS or Y Institute. So, yeah, I, I think it was a necessary part of the journey. And I think it led you to where we are today. And you can speak from experience because the other thing that I think is really cool is you're not someone like a lot of the folks in professional development is the bucket I'll drop it in. Uh, they don't they've never built anything. Right. But you've built it and you have a compelling story where you can explain to people like, yeah, I mean, I I was a one percenter, right? I was making plenty of money as a dentist, which is part of the reason why people go into dentistry. But that isn't the money wasn't enough. You can speak from experience and say the prestige of being in that title, which isn't one of your whys, which a whole lot of people think is a why is not enough there's something underneath that. And if you're, I'm patient zero, right? I did it on me. And then I helped a bunch of other people do it. And I know it to be true. I don't believe it to be true. I don't think it's true. I know it to be true because of my lived experience. And I just think it's magical and it makes the story even more compelling. So it's my two cents, but. You know, as I hear you say that, I think word choice is so critical in everything, but especially in this. It wasn't I was on the wrong path. I was on the right path for that time. Mm -hmm. And now I'm on the right path for this time. Mm -hmm. But I think that's a better way to look at it. Well, because yeah. is it what I should have been doing with my life? Yeah, I'm going to say it is because it led to what's next, mm -hmm. which is so critical. So I think for your listeners as well, mm -hmm. you know, the, the what next comes from what's the next path. 
Yeah. What's what's the right path for this time in your life? Yeah. And you know, I I could be out playing golf every day with my buddies that are doing that, but that isn't a path for me. No. I would it's bigger impact. What's yeah. the way the way I describe it is when was the last time you had a software update? Right. So yeah. you you got your program in USC dental school. You you start the practice, then you get another update. You go spend time with Simon, and then there's the there's the uh, hospital incident. You get another update. You get another update when the guy challenges you on taking it to scale. You get another update when you go to mastermind. And some people are getting continuous updates. My phone gets an update once a week, right? My computer gets an update. It seems like every three days. But most of us are running an operating system that we got put on when we were eight, right? And we just keep running that operating system. We don't get an update. And so when you get an update and you, and we could take it to GPS, if you get a new map update, right? They, they refresh the map and there's a direct path to you getting to the outcome that you're supposed to get to. And it tells you how to get there. Who are you not to take that path? Yeah. Yeah. So you know, yeah, to me, to me, the hardest thing, Jerome, is to figure out what do you want? Mm -hmm. That's like mm -hmm. the hardest possible question to answer. With all of the unlimited choices and possibilities out there, it's like, what do you want? And that's hard to figure out. And, you know, knowing your YOS is super helpful in that. But you still got to spend the time and make the choice. And you still got to take the leap. But the people that you're dealing with, you know, have a longer runway to be able to make that choice and so and correct along the way if it's not perfect. But if you can pick something that's in a line with your where you get to live your passion, mm. it just makes it so fun. You know, again, I jumped off the dental wagon and took a leap of faith. Um, and for those of you that are listening, I'm not there yet. The Y Institute isn't where, you know, our, our vision is to be the, the first step in self-awareness, to be known as the first step. When you're trying to figure out who you are, here's where you start. Start mm -hmm. with the YOS and the rest becomes easy easier the um our goal is to impact a billion people in the next 15 years we're not there yet we haven't impacted a billion people yet we're not even close so and i don't want to sound like i have every answer and know everything because that's not the case am i on a path to get there yeah is it a ton of fun yeah is it scary yeah is it the uh, entrepreneurial roller coaster yes one day is the best day ever. The next day is the worst day ever, right? You've been there to your home. Every day is different. But when you have the passion, those days are temporary. Mm -hmm. Those days just the bad one, you, know, you, you end up just remembering the good ones mm -hmm. because you've been through it. You've had, you know, at this stage, you've had enough of the down ones to know it's just a temporary thing. But it's um, it's always on the upward trajectory. But when you have that passion, that's the key. If you don't have the passion, no matter what you're doing, it's not going to be fun. If you have the passion, no matter what you're doing, is going to be a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. So I think Man. that's, you know, that's the key. For those of you that are just about to take the leap into your next, make sure you have passion for what you do. All the rest won't even really matter. You'll just have so much fun with it. I'm so glad you said have passion for it because I hear so many people saying, I got to find my purpose. And I think your purpose is revealed on the journey. I, I, and if you're doing it with passion, if you're doing it with high energy, like you get there faster and 
things just become clear fast. So, man, your dream catcher, Dr. Gary Sanchez. Um, I'm so grateful that our paths crossed. Uh, you are going to pack a billion lives and then some. You won't be able to count them all because you're helping people become aware and awareness is so important. And for all of those who are out there trying to figure it out on their own, I will tell you that it's the most inefficient and effective way. Reading the jar, the label on the jar from the inside is extremely difficult. And so (laughs) with an investment of less than a hundred dollars and less than 10 minutes of your time, you can have words that make things really clear, which then allows you to make decisions and get closer to whatever you're supposed to be moving to. So thank you so much for sharing what you guys are doing at the Y Institute and giving me exposure to my YOS because it's a game changer, man, for sure. Awesome. Thanks, Jerome. Thanks for having me here. For sure. All right, to the listeners. We'll catch you on the next episode. Your dreams should be real.